Hey, everybody. I hope you found that as interesting and challenging to watch as I did. It, it, it wasn't easy, but uh, such a fascinating piece of history. It was very personally interesting for me because in 1970, which was this, that's the era that this documentary starts in, that was when I first became an activist, you know, and I, I so remember how we didn't think there was anything strange about a lot of white guys telling everybody what to do and running things. So it was, I think it's an important time for us to, to look at and think of all the changes that have happened. And this conversation that we're now going to have is one of the most beautiful and dramatic examples of how things have changed since the early 70s. We're going to be talking to Ebony Martin and Annie Leonard, who co-lead Greenpeace USA. What a change. How exciting. We're also talking to Georgia Faye Hursty, who has trained thousands of people in skills ranging from climbing, welding, conflict resolution to leadership. And she's, she's built teams ready to face the most extreme circumstances. And she herself has faced the most extreme circumstances in, um, in the cause of nonviolent direct action, which she views as a powerful, people-centered tactic for change. Welcome, welcome to you all, and thanks for, for joining me for our movie night, Ebony, Annie, and Georgia. Um, 2021 is Greenpeace's 50th anniversary, and after seeing the film, how the original Greenpeace leaders were passionate, courageous, but also argued and ultimately went in different ways. I find it just amazing that Greenpeace is still here. Why do you think Greenpeace has been able to, to continue to, to survive and thrive decade after decade, overcoming challenges within the organizations as well as those outside the organizations? This is a question to all, of, well, and to Annie and Ebony. You start that, Annie. Oh, thanks, Annie. So, um, I think it's amazing and the film really hit me um, just to see the trajectory of the organization and how it started as a social justice movement, essentially. Um, and I think the key to our survival at Greenpeace is that we are always collectively going through some sort of change management process, whether it's programmatically, culturally, operationally, we are always evolving. We're always changing. We understand that the problems that we face now are even more complex. And in order for us to be fit for purpose, we have to change and evolve with those times. And we're always looking, taking calculated risks. Um, Georgia can tell you a lot about that. Testing, innovating, um, looking and trying to remain flat, uh, agile and flexible. So I think those things especially are key to our success. And often people um, in other groups will call and they'll say, how are you all coping with this? And we're always, we're, we're always in a crisis change management sort of mode. And so that's what a lot of people also lean on us for. And that even though it's sometimes tough to manage, it's been key to our success. Yeah. And to be clear, Jane, our staff are still passionate and still argue like crazy. <laughs> we still argue, but we know that we are still all on Team Greenpeace, Team Movement, Team Planet. And so even though we argue, we try to argue with the lens of making everybody smarter, like in a good argument, everybody ends up smarter. Right. Um, so we still argue. We are still passionate. We are still taking risks and uh, we're still here. I don't know if it's a bias that I have, but over the 40, 50 years that I've been an activist, I, I feel that women leadership, female leadership knows better how to steer arguments in a, in a constructive direction. So I think, I think the fact that, that Greenpeace has evolved in terms of its leadership and its and it's staffing, I it probably has something to do with it too. You know, one thing that struck me and I'm sure struck the audience watching this 
were all the white dudes. I mean, no wonder there was so little practical advice uh, or <laughs> no studying influences. That's, I think, <laughs> what happens when there's a lack of female leadership. Tell us how, how this has evolved and in what other ways Greenpeace has changed since its inception in 71. Well, the truth is there wasn't actually a lack of female leadership. There was a lack of female leaders in front of the cameras. There were a lack of female leaders in the stories. In the, in the first ship um, voyage that Greenpeace took, the captain actually prohibited women from being on the ship. And so that's why there were all men there. But the whole idea to do that voyage came from two women, from Marie Bolin and Dorothy Stowe. It was their idea. So the idea for Greenpeace was born by women. So there were a lot of women there um, making things happen. I think definitely it wouldn't have lasted 50 years without strong women. What's different now is that women's voice is more recognized. There's more space for the women. Um, we're no longer uh, willing to just you know, be behind the scenes. And you see the change happening around the world. So in, in Greenpeace US, we have uh, women leaders at the executive director level, at the senior management team level. The head of our actions team is a woman. It's, it's mostly women led at Greenpeace US. And globally, uh, the, the, the top leader of Greenpeace globally is a woman, Jennifer Morgan, who's been on Fire Girl Fridays. So there's a real lot of women that have always been here, but are now actually taking the leadership mantle, not just giving the good advice for then the men to go take the credit for. So things are changing. Uh, can, can you share how Greenpeace has worked? To, this is for you, Ebony. How has Greenpeace worked to increase racial diversity and advance racial justice in the five decades since its founding? Well, as Annie said, we've done a lot of work to amplify the voices that have been largely silenced over the last few years. I think it's taken an even greater um, spin in the last two to three years, so to speak, even on the global level. So we also know that the problems that we're facing today, environmental justice, pollution, economic equality, um, a broken healthcare system, all of these things are connected. And we live in a world, unfortunately, that prioritizes profits and gains over the health and well-being of our citizens and even the planet. And we know that we're in a climate emergency now. And if we are to defeat this moment, we have to build the strongest, most collectively diverse group of people that stand united together to bring the change we wanna see in the world. And Greenpeace understands that environmental justice is racial justice, and we have to advance solutions that collectively advance justice. So these things have helped to unite us and move us forward in that direction. And also we have the great fortune of being a part of a global organization. So we have 27 offices, well actually 27 independent RROs and like 55 offices across the world, across the world. So we understand that we're stronger, united together. So that is our work in advancing racial justice also in, in Greenpeace nationally and Greenpeace globally. You know, I so appreciated that that aspect of, of Greenpeace because, you know, as, as you know, we had when when the pandemic hit, Fire Drill Fridays started to to do our once a week rallies virtually. And um, we were doing that when George Floyd was murdered um, and Annie Leonard and, and the team at Greenpeace was so um, important at that time in helping f me and Fire Drill Fridays bring together the threads of, of police violence, racism, and the climate crisis together. I think we did a really good job of, um, of showing the connection bet bet between them. I'll always be grateful for that. Um, I, I know that racial and gender diversity isn't the only thing that has evolved over the years in Greenpeace. Another thing that's changing is, is how the organization engages its members. Um, I, I heard you use the phrase, Greenpeace is a hero among heroes. What does that mean? And how is the shift, how is that a shift from Greenpeace's origins? I can take that one again. So a hero among heroes is sort of like also the evolution of our activists, our supporters, our donors, 
everyone who stands with us that wants to see collective change in the world. Um, we understand that we're more powerful together and we need everyone to take a bold and courageous act. And we have to also understand that everyday folks, everybody has a different role in the movement. I often say someone has to stay home and watch the kids. Someone has to strategize. Someone has to march. Someone has to make the sandwiches. Someone has to get the bell money to come get us out. We all have different roles in the movement. No one role is more important. We need everyone together. So all of us are heroes, no matter what role we serve in this fight. The fact that we stand together and we work together, it makes us a hero. So it's not just the guys selling into the nuclear system, the nuclear test site. It's not just the guys dropping the banner. It's me also running down to the police station to make sure that everyone is taken care of. It's also me standing on the sidelines with my, my, my sign demanding change. We all are heroes. And that's um, the evolution that we've also tried to take our supporters and our, our donors on as well. Yeah, that, that, that notion became so clear to me when uh, Fire Drill Friday started with our, our direct action and nonviolent civil disobedience in Washington, D.C. in the fall of, of 2019. I remember the first time I was arrested and after being held for about four hours, I came out into the sunshine and there was a whole group uh, with food and drink and fruit and <laughs> welcoming everybody and applauding. Um, now I can't remember what it's, what's it called, Annie? Jail support. Jail support. <laughs> we have. Jail support. I mean, I, I almost started crying. I was so surprised and moved and everybody said, no, this is, this is part of the whole deal. This is what we do. And I realized over the many, many months that we did it, that that jail support was just as important as everything else. It played such a crucial, crucial role. Let me ask you a question, Georgia. It's clear that direct action has been crucial to, to Greenpeace's work since that small team of activists set sail, right? Um, how would you define direct action and how can it be an effective tool for activism? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think you know, and direct action has shifted and changed over the years as well for Greenpeace. And I think the two ways that direct action is really powerful is first, it is people putting their bodies on the line and stopping something bad from happening. And that, and that has a number of different effects, both in the kind of immediate where the thing is stopped and also the ripple effects of the narrative. And the second piece of why direct action for me, and I think for Greenpeace is so impactful, is because the personal journey that any individual has to take to reach into the deepest parts of themselves and find hope for a better world, enough to take an action that puts themselves potentially at harm, their community potentially at risk, is a powerful journey that every individual activist and their greater community goes on to say, enough is enough and I am willing to take this stand. And as we move through that space as individual activists and as a, as a community and move together, that strengthens the movement. And so I think direct action is particularly effective because those two streams of power that come together to, to make really immediate and uh, effective changes while strengthening the movement. And tell us about some of the memorable direct actions that you've been involved in. Oh, there's so many and memorable, you know, there's memorable in all kinds of ways. But, you know, one of the things that is really, I think, stunning to me, and this speaks uh, to what Ebony was just saying, was part of the transition for me in my time at Greenpeace and, and watching Greenpeace evolve is Greenpeace has learned as we have shifted into a more, uh, a more environmental justice focused lens to let go of the message box and say, we don't need to have the kind of dominance of the message coming from whatever the, a particular specific leader is or this kind of patriarchal framing. We can let people speak for themselves and we can let people be their individual nuanced, beautiful selves. And if racial justice has brought you to this moment where we need to take action on climate, then let's tell that story. And if it's a personal story about your 
child asthma, we can tell that story. And if it's about your community or a forest that you love being decimated, we can tell that story. And so the ways that we come to a particular direct action uh, can be varied and nuanced. And I think that makes the action more powerful. And the specific action I'm thinking of is the one that we did in Portland, where we had 13 climbers and so many anchor support and so many community members that were supporting the action that was part of a much bigger uh, coalition. And we didn't have any signs. There was no banner but because there didn't need to be one because people could tell their own stories of the, of the, of the necessity to be at that moment and to make change. And we demonstrated that by taking direct action and hearing from individuals and the kind of ra the range of paths that brought us to that moment, I think is what made the story of stopping the Fenica in Portland in 2016 so powerful. Well, what did you do physically? What did we do physically? Well, so there was uh, the Fenica, which was a ship that had been contracted by Shell, had run aground and was seeking repairs in Portland. And we found this choke point at St. John's Bridge. And so 13 climbers descended in the middle of the night and created essentially a human blockade so that they, they formed a line in the air about 100 feet below the bridge and 100 feet above the water to stop the ship from being able to pass through. And every moment, every minute that we prevented the ship from passing under the bridge was another minute that the Arctic was spared from drilling because the season is short and the ship had a mission critical piece of um, uh, machinery. So they couldn't start drilling until the ship got there. Wow. And, you know, the polar pioneer had recently been in Seattle. And so all of the work from the coalition around stopping Shell from Seattle had come to Portland. And so there was this moment that Greenpeace was a part of a much, much bigger movement that started way before us. And, you know, we were just one beautiful part of. And so the climbers went over the bridge in the middle of the night. There were kayak activists in the water. There were people in the park. There were support on the bridge. And as Ebony mentioned, there was jail support. There were people passing us down burritos at one point, which was to this day, the best burrito I've ever had in my life. The 13 climbers had camps and we were there for 40 hours. And at about our, maybe at Annie, maybe you remember, I think it was about hour 28, the Fenica came and we rappelled down because we were letting other ships pass underneath. Uh, the Fenica came and we had a moment where we stood kind of face to face where the ship came right up to under the bridge and called us on the radio and said, move. And we said, no, we're not going to move because what you're doing is putting not only us in danger in this moment, but the actions will contribute to putting the entire human race in danger and the future of our, of our, of our children and our children's children. And it's not, we're not moving. And the ship stopped. And I tell you, I think for everyone, it was the longest, I don't know, two minutes <laughs> probably ever existed. And then the ship turned around and you could hear from, from where I was under the bridge, you could hear the uproar of applause come from the, from the waters below, from the kayakers, from the kayak activists, from the people, because the moment what that action did was it captured the imagination that it is possible to speak truth to power, that it is possible to stand in front of a ship and refuse to move and that they will be the ones that back down. It was the most, in my experience, <laughs> tangible and manifestation of what direct action is. And the ship turned around and went back to port. Um, it came again the next day, but for a moment, we everything that Greenpeace stands for that the environmental justice movement is trying to do manifested in that moment with no signs. And um, it was a long 40 hours, but a really, a really powerful one. Wow. Thanks for telling that story. Can I add something to that to make sure that the viewers see that was incredibly powerful. I mean, Georgia was one of those climbers hanging on the end of a rope for two days in the just scorching heat. It was she did an amazing job. It was powerful for the climbers. It was powerful for the people watching, but it was it was also impactful. It also worked. Um, this was such a dramatic act of courage that it was on the national news like crazy. 
all these people started calling Shell Oil and say, don't drill in the Arctic. They started calling us and saying, how can they help? Um, Obama then called the mayor of Portland to come meet him in Washington, D.C. because of this action to talk about what are they going to do about Shell drilling? Like it just it turned the volume up on the movement, this this inc incredibly inspiring thing. And then Shell announced it wasn't going to drill in the Arctic. So I want people to know it's not just beautiful. It's not just powerful. It delivers the goods. It, it wins works. campaigns. It works. Before COVID, um, we had uh, Fire Drill Fridays taking direct action in the street every week. For, for many firefighters, it was their first time putting their body on the line and risking arrest for a cause they believed in. And they, they all said how powerful the experience was. Does does that resonate with, with you three? Absolutely. Think of how many times a day you watch the news, you look at suffering outside of your window, you think, oh, why is this one doing something? What can I do? Like, we think that all the time. And when you take direct action, as Georgia said, you just, you, you fill your whole body with commitment to the cause. You're doing the ultimate thing that you can do. And it feels so good, as we've talked about before, Jane, aligning your values and your body. It feels so good to put yourself 100% online instead of just being like, oh, why isn't someone doing something? So I find it both inspiring for the people watching and deeply inspiring. It feels so good. There's, there's not that often that our values and our actions can be so 100% aligned in our sort of contradiction rich society that we live in. So yeah. we highly recommend it. Sure is a great way to get over climate despair. Right. right. We'll be out there again as soon as we can. So I hope all the viewers watching are ready to join us. Greenpeace doesn't just engage in, in uh, direct action, but you know, teaches others how to do it safely and strategically. Georgia, tell me about Greenpeace's Action Camp. Who who attends it and what, what are its goals? Action Camp dates back a long time. We've been doing annual Action Camps again since 2012. You know, sometimes I think of it as kind of a, a grown-up uh, summer camp. It is a beautiful week and a half of activists from across movements, and across ideas and across the country and internationally as well that come together to learn direct action skills and to share with each other about the campaigns they're working on, how they strategize, what they're thinking of, how we can ally the different movements for justice and make them stronger. And so it is a week and a half or so of skill building, of networking, of building deep and important bonds with one another. And, and to also find some time to celebrate and to, to be joyful and to, and to be, you know, work on friendships and make music and sing. And I think that there is, you know, and we've talked about this a lot, I know, on Fire Drill Friday, but we are in a climate emergency. Things are scary right now. And to take time to rest and to celebrate and to be with one another and to, and to celebrate each other is something that we are able to do. Also at Action Camp, as we're learning, uh, we teach climbing and advanced climbing, rope access, uh, blockading. There's an arts track, Arts for Protest, where people learn how to make banners, how to sew, how to find creative ways to tell a story, how to silk screen. Um, you know, and some people come and they learn climbing one year and the next year they learn arts. Um, but I think aside from all of the skills, which are wonderful, the most powerful part of Action Camp is this kind of cross movement uh, coming together of learning how we can be stronger to advance justice, which is ultimately the goal. Beautiful. In, in the documentary that we just watched, Bob Hunter talks about the need to create a, a mind bomb which he describes as an image that sends a collective shock through the world leading to action. What are, Annie, what are some mind bombs for the climate crisis? So a yeah, mind bomb is something that shakes up your thinking so much you can never see things the same. And right now, because the climate crisis is here now, nature is giving us mind bombs regularly. You know, um, the, the ocean on fire, we all saw that picture, right? That's so jarring. Um, the forest fires, the, the uh, just charred and ruined towns, the, the pictures of the people on the roof in New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina, you know, the, the drowned Syrian refugee child, you know, escaping 
violence that was linked to climate crisis. There's so many images coming at us that change how we think. So our job then is to create the images and disseminate them that give us the hope. You know, think about that lone image of lone Greta, a little schoolgirl holding her sign saying strike for the climate. That image went all over the world and inspired people to action. The image of the, of the activists hanging off the bridge that Georgia described in that Portland action, that image is amazing. Some artists in Portland did a um, vacant wall with a mural of that action while we were there. If you go on eBay, there are pictures of um, or items like a, somebody sent me a cloth canvas bag with the picture on it that somebody had painted. Artists have done things. It has just inspired such um, creativity and commitment so those are the kind of mind bombs we need more of, are the ones that don't trigger despair like the ocean on fire, but that trigger um, action and courage like, like Greta, like the climbers in Portland. Ebony, why is bearing witness central to Greenpeace's mission? And can anyone bear witness? So Annie often says, um, once you know, you owe. And bearing witness can take form in many different instances. Um, Jane, for instance, you bear witness when you take folks to see people living near the oil wells and seeing the, the harm that it causes people that live in those communities and in those environments. Greenpeace bears witness when we write reports on dark money in our democracy. Um, we bear witness every day. And once we do and we see something is wrong, it's our responsibility to shine a light, to amplify the voices of those who cannot lift up their voices in the moment and to get them help. So bearing witness is, is it's like taking that mind bomb and taking it to the next level and figuring out what ways can you enact change, not just of yourself, but you can get your community to rally around and help to bring change as well. So anybody, anywhere can bear witness. And it's also one of the roles that we need in this movement to bear witness, to shine the light on injustices so that the people who can make the change are motivated and activated to make the change. Mm -hmm. So it's another form of activism. Mm -hmm. um, Annie, what can Fire, Fire Drill Friday's um, followers, what can they do to work more with Greenpeace? Oh, that's my favorite question. Um, come on in. We would love to have you all join. I know many of you actually already are involved, but if you aren't yet, please join. There's so many ways you can be involved with Greenpeace. We have um, teams of people who call their senators and Congress members. We have a new system where local leaders can get trained and we'll give you a coach and help you develop your activist skills. And you can start a local pod to organize in your own community or campus or church or workplace. We have so many ways to get involved. You can go to our website and there's a, a place to sign up to volunteer. But the easiest thing is to text and you can text the word Jane because this is what Jane does with us all the time. So you can be like Jane, text the word Jane to this number, 86799. We used to have a different number that you may have heard about, but we shared that number with other organizations and so many people are signing up that we couldn't share it anymore. So we had to get our own number now, which is a good thing. So text the word Jane to the number eight six seven nine nine and we'll immediately send you some information to sign up and there are as many ways to engage as there are people so you don't have to do something that you don't want to do unless unless you want to stretch your comfort zone which which we can help you do that but there's lots of ways we need artists we need jail support we need um advocates uh, we need all kinds of people and we would love to have you all come join us and be part of this movement with jane and georgia and ebony and me thanks annie Yes, because let's remember, we are the last generation that can force a, a course change that can, can save, un, I don't know how many lives and species. We're the ones, it's, it's on our shoulders. It's a beautiful responsibility, actually. Thank you all so much for being part of this conversation. I'm so glad that you all are in the leadership of Greenpeace USA. I'm so proud to work with Greenpeace. I'm so grateful to your leadership at Greenpeace and um, see you next time.
Thank you. Bye. Bye.